Hey everybody, David Gregg here with the Rhode Island Natural History Survey. Uh, right now we've got a video that was made by Carolyn Decker, who just finished her Master's of Science degree from the University of Rhode Island studying diamondback terrapins. And uh, sometimes to make important scientific discoveries, you have to follow baby turtles around in the woods. Take a look at this presentation by Carolyn of her Master's thesis results. The Rhode Island Natural History Survey presents videos to showcase the animals, plants, geology, and natural systems that surround us, and the people and organizations working to understand and conserve them. Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for watching this presentation. For the next 40 to 50 minutes, I will be sharing my Master's of Science research on the post-emergence movements and habitat use by hatchling diamondback terrapins, Malaclemus terrapin. I conducted this research while at the University of Rhode Island with my advisor, Dr. Nancy Carricker, with additional support by Dr. Scott Buchanan and Professor Jason Jacks. This research was supported by a variety of funding from the University of Rhode Island, the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management, the Diamondback Terrapin Working Group, the Barrington Land Conservation Trust, the Henry and Teresa Gonzalo Research Grant from the Rhode Island Natural History Survey, and the Rhode Island chapter of the Nature Conservancy and Global Marine Team. I want to take a moment and acknowledge that my fieldwork was conducted on the traditional lands of the Narragansett, Poconoke, and Wampanoag peoples. There have been so many past and current stewards of these lands and waters, and I want to recognize that the knowledge I've gained in this project is just part of the many ways of knowing and living among our communities of people and wildlife. I also want to recognize and acknowledge the wildlife, the lands, and the waters themselves as my teachers and thank them for their gifts. So many people helped me to do this work. Some are pictured here and many more are not, but I hope you know who you are and feel my sincere gratitude. This work would not have been possible without the incredible collaboration from the Barrington Terrapin Conservation Group. So thank you to the whole volunteer team, especially the leaders, Pete McCalmont, Charlotte Sorenborger, Catherine Beauchamp, and Madeline Link. So who are these creatures, the diamondback terrapins, scientific name Malaclemus terrapin? Here is an adult female terrapin that I filmed swimming in the creek at our study site. The word terrapin comes from the Algonquin for good tasting turtle, an important clue in the millennia of relationship between terrapins and people. Terrapins are the only at only estuarine turtle in North America, and they have some incredible adaptations for life in the salt marsh. They're arguably a keystone species within the estuary. Terrapins range from Massachusetts to Texas, as well as in Bermuda. Remember that terrapins are salt marsh specialists, so they're only along the coasts. In Rhode Island, where I did my work, terrapins are state endangered, meaning there are only a few known populations. And I'm not naming our exact study location because of the risk of identifying rare turtle populations to the big problem of illegal collection and wildlife trafficking. Just knowing some interesting facts about these animals isn't enough to conserve them. To do that, we really need to care. So here are some of my reasons why we should care about terrapins. First, because diamondback terrapins, like all species, have inherent worth, I would argue that we have a duty to conserve them simply because they exist. But beyond that, we should care because human activities put terrapins at risk. We kill terrapins as they cross roads seeking nest sites. We trap them in crab pots as fishing bycatch. We poach them for the meat and pet trades. Especially in the 19th and early 20th centuries, we overharvested terrapins for food. Terrapin soup was considered a delicacy, famously served by President Taft at the White House. In the Risty Museum here in Providence, you can see this giant fine silver terrapin soup terrine, uh, which was made here in the Providence Jewelry District. Oddly enough, prohibition likely helped save the terrapin because you need sherry to make terrapin soup. And as our diets changed through the mid 20th century, the remaining terrapins started to have a chance to recover. But 
our appetites for coastal development did not wane. And habitat loss remains the biggest threat to terrapins as a species. According to a 2005 assessment uh, depicted in this graph here, over 53% of Rhode Island salt marshes have been destroyed over the last 200 years. And this is the highest percentage of any New England state. Today, sea level rise and coastal development continue to put our estuaries and their wildlife at risk. Still, what good does it do people to conserve terrapins? Well, our estuaries and our coastlines are immensely valuable, both ecologically and economically, supporting industries like fisheries, tourism, filtering pollutants, supporting biodiversity and mitigating storms. We should care about terrapins because their functional ecological roles help safeguard these valuable places. So let's dive a little deeper into those functional roles. Functional roles are the biological characteristics that distinguish how a group fits into the functioning of their larger community. Things like predator-prey relationships or nutrient cycling, for example. With terrapins, one of their main functional roles is being an apex predator in the marsh, especially of animals like these purple marsh crabs and these periwinkle snails. When these invertebrates become overabundant, maybe because that top-down predation pressure from terrapins is absent, these snails can graze the marsh grasses down to nothing. The crabs can burrow holes in the peat to a massive extent and destabilize that substrate. As you can see in this diagram, when the marsh is overgrazed and those holes become really abundant, the marsh erodes and disappears. So coupled with sea level rise, this destabilization means the marsh is facing destruction on multiple fronts. Conserving terrapins can help conserve the whole salt marsh community by maintaining the integrity of that food web. So with all those conservation reasons and all of that ecology in mind, how do our management activities impact our efforts? This is an aerial photo from fall 2020 of my study site in Rhode Island, you can see that there's a mix of habitats in and around this wildlife refuge. The open waters of the cove, the salt marsh, the forests, sandy areas, meadows, agricultural fields, and this site is managed for a variety of conservation priorities. These meadows are maintained via mowing to keep them from growing up into forest. And this supports a lot of shrubland birds, mammals, wildflowers, and pollinating insects. One of the birds that the managers aim to support in these meadows are eastern bluebirds, these gorgeous symbols of happiness. The site is also an increasingly important place uh, where managers are trying to establish and propagate the wild lupin, which is declining in most New England states and requires very specific sandy soil conditions. And of course, the top priority and the reason I got involved is the terrapins. At this site, the largest known remaining terrapin population in Rhode Island has been conserved and monitored by local experts in that community science group for over 30 years. Properly conserving and managing wildlife and their habitats means intimately understanding the life history of these animals. We can think of the estuary as the primary habitat for terrapins. It's where they feed, bask, mate, and spend most of their lives. Terrapins also need coastal uplands for nesting habitat. The females need to lay their eggs in just the right sandy soil conditions, and she will return to that same site year after year, a phenomenon we call strong site fidelity. We don't think that male terrapins ever really return to the upland as adults, but it's critical for the long-term stability of these populations that the females have a safe, successful place to nest. However, this understanding of terrapin habitat use, with uplands really only being important in the summertime during nesting season, is largely based on adult terrapins. So, what about hatchlings? How do they differ from their adult counterparts? They look like many adults, but their functional roles are different. They are the source of recruitment in the population, but unlike the adults 
who are mostly predators, the hatchlings fulfill an important eco ecological role as prey. Out of the thousands of eggs that are laid each year, less than 10% are likely to survive to adulthood, and most of those hatchlings are prey to other animals, other mammals, other birds in the marsh and in the upland. So to overcome that low, low likelihood of survival, what habitats do they need? We know that adult terrapins overwinter in the soft mud of the salt marsh creeks, but where do hatchling terrapins overwinter? Where do they go to survive this very vulnerable time in their lives? Until recently, overwintering habitat use by hatchlings has been a scientific mystery. Unveiling that mystery is important because hatchlings may experience different impacts, different risks in different habitats at different times. For example, the upland meadows at our study site are mowed every November. That mowing is necessary to manage this wildlife refuge and achieve its different conservation goals. But how might that mower be impacting the hatchling terrapins, especially if they stay on land? Are we inadvertently undermining our long-term conservation goals with our management activities? To tackle that question, we needed to develop some specific research aims. In some earlier research in New York, Dr. Russ Burke observed that some terrapin hatchlings overwintered on land, not moving to the salt marsh until the following spring. And this was counter to the general assumption that these semi-aquatic turtles would move toward the water after they left their nests. So we wanted to know if this was also the case here in Rhode Island. So we developed these four research aims. Number one, determine whether terrapin hatchlings overwinter on land in Rhode Island. Two, map the overwintering habitats used by hatchling terrapins. Three, to determine a timeline of movement activity by the hatchlings. And four, to inform our land management practices based on the habitat needs of hatchling terrapins. So this brings us to the next big question. How did we do this work? What were our methods? The first thing you may wonder, how did we find these hatchlings to study them? Thanks to my collaborators, the local community scientists, we had hundreds of known protected nests to potentially sample for emerging hatchlings. The nests at our study site are protected under excluders like this one. Uh, these are wire mesh cages that are placed after the eggs are laid and it protects these nests from predators like coyotes, skunks, raccoon, raccoons, and crows. So we checked each of these excluders, each of these nests daily in late summer and early fall. And over the two years of our study, the community scientists protected 271 nests, producing over 2,400 hatchlings from which we could sample. From those, I tagged 178 hatchlings. These were sampled from 59 different nests generally two or three hatchlings per nest. Each nest tends to have 11 or 12 eggs. We were trying to capture more variation across nests to understand the population more broadly, rather than sampling whole clutches to learn about within clutch patterns. To track their movements, I attached tiny tracking devices to the hatchling shells. On 46 hatchlings, we epoxied both a radio transmitter and a pit tag, a passive integrated transponder. And these devices allowed us to get precise movement and habitat use data from this group. The radio transmitters emit a signal, which we can follow with our telemetry gear. The pit tags don't emit a signal, but if we pass over them with our readers, we can detect them and get a unique ID number. On another 132 hatchlings, we attached just a pit tag. Although we couldn't get as much precise movement data from this group, they taught us a lot about overwintering habitat use and allowed us to inexpensively increase our sample size. We did have a potential bias in our sample toward larger hatchlings because they had to be big enough to carry these devices. The tags and the epoxy had to be less than 10% of the hatchling's total body mass, which is standard in, tur in a turtle research. The total combined weight of the devices was less than 0.6 grams, which is about two or three grains of cooked white rice. 
but the hatchlings themselves are about the same weight as a campfire marshmallow, so everything here had to be very small and lightweight. Once they were tagged, we tracked the hatchlings through fall, winter, and spring. Our study spanned two August to June field seasons over two years from 2019 to 2021. I tracked the radio tagged hatchlings using radio telemetry, a classic method in studying wildlife movements. Each transmitter has a unique radio frequency, which uh, has a beep that's emitted every five seconds over 90 days. By listening to the signal strength from that transmitter, I could follow those signals and pinpoint each hatchling's location within one meter on a daily basis, then three times a week, and then weekly through the winter. Once we had homed in on that signal from the radio, we could confirm their exact, exact overwintering site within 10 centimeters using that sweeping pit tag reader. This is a metal detector looking device that we called the sweeper. We searched the habitat using that sweeper in two meter wide transects back and forth around the site, which allowed us to find many more hatchlings overwintering sites than if we had relied on the radio transmitters alone. All told, we searched with that sweeper over about 9.8 acres of habitat, and with our combined efforts, we swept for over a thousand hours searching for hatchlings. We swept these areas multiple times through the fall, winter, and spring to make sure we had good coverage. And we focused on these upland areas because that's where the management activities were mostly focused. In regards to spring reemergence, from mid-April to early June, we resumed daily checks on the hatchlings' overwintering locations to find out if they had reemerged. This is hatchling 1330 on the left, right after this hatchling emerged on May 22nd, 2021. And this is the same hatchling with a new radio tag. These radio tags were very expensive and we had a limited supply, so we only had six replacement radios for spring movement tracking. Tracking those spring movements wasn't an initial priority when we were planning this project, so I'm happy I was able to collect some information about those spring movements from this subset. Whether a hatchling got a replacement radio like this or not, each hatchling that we re-encountered in the spring was weighed and measured, same as it was in the fall, and then we released them and observed their subsequent movements as best we could. So given those methods, what have we learned? Let's talk about my results. Toward my first research aim of determining whether the terrapin hatchlings overwinter on land in Rhode Island. Indeed, yes, they do overwinter on land. Out of the 83 hatchlings with known fates, we documented 23 hatchlings, or 27.7%, remaining in the upland and surviving to re-emerge the following spring. These hatchlings are overwintering under moderate to dense vegetative cover, about six centimeters below ground. But it's not such a simple story because not all the hatchlings stayed on land. 11 hatchlings, or 13.3%, went immediately to the salt marsh in the fall, generally within a few days of hatching. I'll get into the potential drivers of these different habitat use strategies in a few minutes, but know that this was a really exciting finding about this divergent habitat use in both years. If you're wondering what about all of the other hatchlings, many were predated, many had unknown fates if they went beyond our search area or we couldn't uh, recover them by the end of the study which was something we expected given the tracking methods we were using. But knowing about these divergent habitat uses was really interesting, and what was especially astonishing about it was that these hatchlings are not growing during those nine months. We measured a statistically significant loss in body mass between fall emergence and spring reemergence, about 10% of body mass loss. But they weren't uh, shrinking in other body measurements, so they're persisting just on the remnant energy from their yolk sacs. They're not moving around to forage while they're remaining in these upland overwintering sites. Toward research aim two of mapping those overwintering habitats, again, here's our fall 2020 aerial photo and our main search area. We did track hatchlings beyond this into the marsh and other areas, but this was our main focus because of the impact of those upland management activities. 
So these maps are showing the movement paths by the hatchlings that remained in the upland. The sandy areas are marked in tan, the meadow brushlands in orange, forests in green, salt marsh in teal, and open water in blue. On the left are the paths taken by the 23 hatchlings who remained in the upland. And the white dots are showing their starting positions at the nests and red squares for their overwintering sites. Now let's compare this to the map on the right of hatchlings who moved to the marsh. So what's interesting here is that the hatchlings that remained on land changed locations fewer times than the hatchlings that went to the marsh. 17 of the 23 hatchlings who remained in the upland arrived at their overwintering site within 24 hours of nest emergence. These hatchlings are overwintering near habitat edges in brushlands, generally within about two meters of a habitat edge, and they're overwintering just six centimeters underground on average, typically under dense shrubs and herbaceous growth in sandy soil, occasionally under a layer of leaf litter and other plant debris. Because of some radio transmitter failures once hatchlings entered the salt water of the marsh, or because they traveled beyond our search area of their own volition or because they were carried off by a predator, we only knew of two overwintering sites in the marsh. Although that sample size is way too small to reveal any true patterns, it does seem like hatchlings were traveling westward and northward into this marsh creek and high marsh areas rather than the open waters of the cove when they went to the marsh. So this is showing the same habitat area, but I wanna focus on a different GIS analysis that we did to understand the smallest area that would need to be protected to protect these overwintering hatchlings. So these white dots are representing the nest locations for the hatchlings that overwintered in the upland. And here's our legend for reference. This white polygon is the smallest area to encompass those nests. It's called a minimum convex polygon. Now let's bring in those fall movement paths and the overwintering sites by the hatchlings. We focused on these ones in the upland again because they're the ones most vulnerable to those upland management activities on site. This polygon is showing us the smallest area that encloses those overwintering sites. For visual clarity, I've taken away the movement paths and the nest icons so, so we can notice these two polygons and compare them. When we do, we find a 1 to 1.6 ratio of nesting area, that white polygon, to overwintering area, the red and black. This gives us a benchmark for the most critically sensitive areas where management activities could put the hatchlings at risk. The other really exciting thing here is we can use this minimum convex polygon analysis to do a habitat suitability analysis. We can statistically compare the available habitats within that red outline, all those different colored habitat types, versus the proportion of hatchlings that overwintered in each habitat. So when we do that, we find that brushland habitat is, based on our chi-square test, disproportionately important for overwintering habitat use. 87% or 20 out of 23 hatchlings were using that brushland, even though it's only about 44% of the available habitat. This is helping us to understand the hatchlings' habitat preferences and the fact that they're really not staying in that open sandy area, even though there's quite a bit of it, and they're not really going into those forests either. They're staying in those brushy meadow edges. Toward my third research aim, we've developed a timeline of movement activity. In the fall, immediately after nest emergence is when we're seeing most of the hatchling movement. By mid-October, the hatchlings have settled into these overwintering sites. Although we didn't directly collect data about the timing of predation, this is when we believe hatchlings are most vulnerable to predators when they're moving around actively in the habitat. From November to March, there's almost no movement. It's just too cold for these little ectotherms here in Rhode Island. I checked on them every week just to see if anything had changed, but they're staying put during this time. Because they're staying put, predation seems to be a very small risk, according to what we observed. From mid-April to June is when those intrepid survivors are re-emerging from those overwintering locations and traveling to the marsh. They don't always move to the marsh on the day they re-emerge, though. 
we observed hatchlings remaining within a meter of their overwintering sites, hidden under the leaf litter, but not reburied underground, up to 10 days following nest emergence or overwintering site reemergence, and then they're going down to the marsh. The last point I'll make about my results relates to the initial dispersal in late summer and early fall, when the hatchlings are coming out of those nests for the first time. These little red arrows are showing the dispersal direction when hatchlings first are released at their nests after we tagged them. They're going in lots of different directions, but the mean dispersal direction was 214 compass degrees, or generally south-southwest, in the direction of the marsh, but not necessarily the whole way there. This is uh, also counter to what previous scientists have observed, that our hatchlings were not consistently dispersing toward the nearest vegetative cover or the nearest edge. We ran a model selection analysis to try and glean whether these patterns in dispersal were related to Julian date or distance from the nest to the nearest edge, if there's any kind of correlation here. None of our model results were particularly compelling, suggesting that there are other factors than the ones we tested that are involved in these dispersal movements. Again, though, we're seeing that movement to the habitat edges on emergence day and few hatchlings remaining in that open nesting area. So given all of these observations, all of these data, what does it all mean? I've arrived at three main interpretations related to evolutionary lineage, phenotypic plasticity, and genetics. To delve into those three interpretations, I first want to contextualize the three types of overwintering strategies and four main stressors that hatchlings must deal with. Herpetology researchers have described hatchling turtle overwintering strategies with three categories. The first is the OIW strategy, overwintering in water or in the marsh. These are the hatchlings that emerged from their nests in the fall and traveled to the marsh. Second is the TIN strategy, hatchlings that overwinter terrestrially inside the nest cavity. They're staying in that nest until spring and emerging for the first time then. We did observe one terrapin nest using this strategy at our study site, so it does happen, but I think it's quite infrequent. And third, the TON strategy, hatchlings that terrestrially overwinter outside the nest, meaning they're emerging in late summer and early fall, reburying themselves elsewhere in the upland and spending the winter there. So we observed all of these strategies. I'm mainly focused on that TON category because of that upland management activity impact. But knowing that all three occur is an important life history insight from our observational study. It hints at the complexity of these turtles' lives and their habitats. But why do they do these different things? Whichever overwintering strategy they use, those questions involve these different stressors. Hatchlings must endure or overcome at least these four big stressors, the first being predation. These hatchlings are little Oreo cookies on the landscape. Their only real defense is to hide. Predators are waiting for them in the upland and in the marsh, and at our site, raccoons, skunks, coyotes, shrews, crows, and owls seem to be the main upland predators. Hatchlings have to balance their energy budget against predation risk. Since hatchlings that go to the marsh are moving further and changing location more frequently, they might be more vulnerable to predators, but they're benefiting by getting earlier access to those resources in the marsh to start feeding and growing. Those that remain on land using the TON strategy might be minimizing their predation risk by dispersing and reburying, but they're delaying that chance to start eating and growing. Staying in the nest cavity, similarly with the TIN strategy, minimizes that energy expense by not moving until spring, but it might be easier for predators to smell or hear whole clutches of hatchlings when they're lumped together in the nest. In addition to predation, freezing is another big stressor. Since hatchlings are, are overwintering so shallow in the substrate, they're above the frost line. Other researchers have found that hatchling terrapins are surprisingly tolerant to freezing temperatures. They're surviving just fine down to 5 degrees Fahrenheit or 15 degrees Celsius, 
largely because of physiological adaptations in their skin and in their blood. The main risk from freezing comes not from the cold, but from exposure to ice crystals. The risk of ice might be lower in the upland than in the saturated conditions of the marsh. Their preference to overwinter outside the nest in that TON strategy under moderate to dense vegetation might also help mediate some of this freezing risk compared to hatchlings that remain in the nest cavity in those more open, exposed, sandy areas. Beyond predation and freezing, desiccation or drying out is another big stressor. Again, we know from other researchers that hatchling terrapins are more tolerant to desiccation than some other turtle species. This is thanks to those physiological adaptations in their blood and in their skin. Also, when terrapins are brewmating, that inactive period during the cold months, their metabolic energy needs plummet, so they don't need as much, en as much energy or moisture to stay hydrated. This desiccation might be another factor in their preference to overwinter under dense vegetation, where they're shaded and where they might have more dew and precipitation than if they were more exposed to the sun in these open sandy areas. And lastly, salinity is a big stressor for hatchlings. Terrapins don't develop their tolerance for higher salinity and those brackish water conditions until they're older and bigger bodied. For those that remain on land, they're avoiding this stressor entirely until the following spring. And in the spring, because of seasonal fluctuations in the salt marsh and its salinity, they might be entering the salt marsh when it's less salty, when the salinity is lower and they're entering it under less stressful conditions. Also, if they're overwintering in the high marsh or entering the high marsh uh, microhabitat, the salinity may be lower than if they were in the low marsh or in the open water. Being near the surface, they might also have better exposure to fresh water through snow melt and dew in both the marsh and in the upland. So let's get into some of these different interpretations for that divergent habitat use with some staying on land and some going to the marsh. My first interpretation is about evolutionary lineage or the tree of life. When we're trying to understand how and why a species does different things, we can look to their nearest relatives for clues. Although terrapins are the only member of their genus, Meliclemus, they're categorized within the freshwater turtle family, Amidae. Amidae. This phylogenetic tree is from a systematic review of Amidae turtle lineages and depicts those relationships. There is still some scientific debate about the classifications within this family, but currently we consider the map turtles, um, the genus Graftemis, to be the terrapin's nearest relatives. And this is a hatchling common map turtle as an example. Notably, none of the other amided turtles use estuarine habitats. Many nest in sandy uplands, but terrapins are special in their use of brackish waters. The field of research on hatchling turtles at all and their habitat use is quite young because hatchlings are hard to study, they're small, they're cryptid, but research on map turtles has found that common map turtles, Graptemis geographica, overwhelmingly overwintered in their nest, that TIN strategy. Meanwhile, other researchers studying uh, Wachita map turtles, Graptemis wachitensis, found that those hatchlings overwintered in the upland outside the nest, that T-O-N strategy. So what does this tell us about terrapins? Well, knowing what other turtles do tells us what their shared an ancestors probably did. Since both terrapins and map turtles have hatchlings that overwinter in the uplands, we can infer that their common ancestor likely used this strategy as well. This means overwintering in the upland is likely the ancestral condition. Overwintering in the salt marsh is probably a much more recent and specialized adaptation by terrapins. We may be witnessing an evolutionary shift as terrapins continue to adapt to those brackish estuarine conditions based on their freshwater lineage. Our second interpretation about why hatchlings have this divergent habitat use is related to phenotypic plasticity. Phenotypic plasticity is classically described in a lot of insects, 
where they have the same genotypes, but they differ in their appearance or phenotype based on environmental conditions like season or temperature or nutrient availability. The same kind of phenomenon could be occurring behaviorally with our hatchlings. So here's an example of a hatchling who overwintered in the upland, number 1312. And here's a hatchling, number 1379, who overwintered in the salt marsh. Now appearance-wise, you know, looking at these two as examples, looking at our whole groups in our sample, there's no morphological difference that we can observe between hatchlings using these different strategies. A t-test on their body mass and plastron lengths also showed no statistical differences between these groups. They emerged over similar time periods, so we're not seeing any big differences there. So we were not able to observe this phenotype and describe it or pinpoint that mechanism, but we suspect that there is a behavioral phenotype that may be driving this behavioral difference in overwintering habitat use. And this is especially relevant uh, if we think about it in terms of group selection and long-term population stability. Hatchlings might be overwintering in these uplands or in the marsh or in both um, as a group, not necessarily because one is the best option with the highest likelihood of survival for any one hatchling. Rather, having this diversity of habitat use as a cohort of hatchlings may provide the greater population with more long-term stability and resilience in the dynamic conditions of the estuary and the coast over time. As they're using these multiple strategies, they're not putting all of their hatchlings in one basket, so to speak. For example, if a nor'easter were to create especially lethal conditions in the marsh one year, maybe the hatchlings overwintering on land stand a better chance at survival. If it's a particularly harsh winter on land, maybe the hatchlings in the marsh fare better. Under these different disturbance events, having a diversity of habitat use by the hatchlings increases the chances that any given hatchling from that cohort can survive. And that means that there's some contribution to the population, no matter what sort of disturbance might be happening. My third interpretation is that there's a genetic diversity driving these different habitat uses. When we're thinking about genetics and heritability of different traits driving hatchlings to overwinter in these different habitats, we need to think about their parents. As uh, a female may lay hundreds of eggs over her lifetime, only one or a handful is likely to replace her. Her offspring carry her genetic traits but there's also genetic contribution from the males. We know that terrapins can have multiple paternity within clutches, and this might be a mechanism for the divergent habitat use patterns that we're observing, especially differences that we're seeing within clutches that may be siblings with different fathers doing different habitat uses. I didn't collect genetic uh, data, so that will have to be left to future research, but I do think that there's something promising here with genetics as the driving factor. This matters because only a small fraction, likely less than 10% of hatchlings and the genetic diversity that they represent, makes it to the reproductive phase to continue passing along those traits. If they can make it to adulthood and go through these different age classes where they have different survival likelihoods, their survival becomes very high, upwards of 95%. Having that diversity in overwintering habitat use as hatchlings may play a role in maintaining that genetic diversity within the adult age class. Truly illuminating this mystery of why the hatchlings use these different habitats during this vulnerable first year is going to take more research. And this is going to have to look into differences within clutches, our siblings doing different things to, uh, you know, patterns beyond what I could observe. What's going on across generations? What's going on with survivorship over many years? These questions can only be pursued if we continue to conserve and manage terrapins now. So this brings us to my fourth aim. Perhaps the most important thing, and I hope and congratulate you for still being with me here if you are. Until we did this research, we had no idea whether or how much this mower or other types of management activities were impacting this terrapin population. 
And based on our findings, we developed a set of management recommendations to help us reduce the impact of these activities and achieve our conservation goals. The specific recommendations that I offer here are tailored to this study site, but I think they can be applied conceptually in other places. First, I recommend continuing to protect as much habitat as possible, at least protecting this 1 to 1.6 ratio of nesting area to, over, um, winching, to vegetated overwintering areas is going to be really important for protecting hatchlings that stay on land in the winter. Second, I recommend limiting the spatial extent of using that heavy machinery in these protected areas. Taking special care to maintain a five meter wide buffer zone around those nesting areas with that shrubby meadow edge will protect the majority of upland overwintering hatchlings. This is especially important given our finding that hatchlings disproportionately prefer those brushy, those brushy edges to overwinter. That buffer zone needs to be hand cut using lightweight tools to limit the risk from heavy machinery going in and potentially crushing or chopping up little hatchlings. Third, I recommend limiting the timing of using that heavy machinery to the cold months of November to March. Since hatchlings aren't moving around during these times, the equipment isn't as likely to harm them if they get hit with the mower blades, but crushing is still a big concern. So this is why our spatial and temporal activities need to be working in tandem. So the hatchlings are just centimeters underground and we need to be really sensitive about where and when we're doing this work. Fourth, I recommend taking special precautions with invasive species management. At this study site, that means focusing on mechanical removal with uh, a focus on bittersweet, honeysuckle, and crabgrass. Although Phragmites, or common reed, isn't actively managed at this site, it is a concern in the salt marsh, so fall spraying with glyphosate and winter mechanical removal may be the best approach, especially if we can exclude hatchlings by putting up drift fencing around treatment areas before hatchlings even have a chance to overwinter in those uh, Phragmite stands. But really this is an area where more research needs to be done because there's a big gap in the literature on the impact of herbicides and these types of treatments on reptiles like terrapins. And I'm happy to report that these management recommendations are very congruent with the activities that are already happening on the site. So I want to offer my kudos to the local experts, these community scientists who have been doing this work and doing it with great care to conserve and manage these terrapins. Hopefully these recommendations can aid that work for even more success in the future. So with that, I want to again express my thanks to all of you for being here today. Thank you again to my funders, and thank you to all of you who helped me to do this work. Please feel free to contact me with any questions at my email address here, carolyn underscore decker at uri.edu. If you'd like a copy of my master's thesis that details all of this work, I'd be happy to share that with you. It is uh, going to be available in the URI library, and we're preparing it for peer review publication as I share this presentation with you right now. So again, thank you for your attendance and best of luck with all of your Terrapin conservation and management activities in the future. Mm -hmm.